Xfinity Studios at WVON. You're listening to Salim Muakil on Chicago's true urban legend, The Talk of Chicago, 1690 AM, WVON. On Wednesday, May 8th, and this is Salim Muwakil on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON. You can also catch us streaming loud and clear at www.wvon.com. Here I am again, privileged to have the pleasure of connecting to America's most astute radio audience. Well, the strange tale of the three kidnapped girls, or women, and its aftermath is, is taking us through the typical kinds of uh, cultural contortions. The women, uh, Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight. Um, Berry is 27, Gina De Jesus is 24, and Knight is 32. They were found in um, a West Cleveland home after neighbors heard screams and acted to allow the women to escape. But whenever some kind of a public controversy arises in this country, the issue of race is usually somewhere in the mix, and um, this particular incident is no different. This time, the issue concerns uh, the antics and motives uh, and, and actions, activities, uh, heroic activities, uh, some say, of Charles Ramsey, the brother who rescued Amanda from the house in which they were imprisoned, the House of Horrors, which everyone is calling it now. Um, much discussion has been about whether um, Charles Ramsey is heroic. Is, is he a, a, a heroic everyman or is he some kind of a buffoon uh, on my particular Facebook page in which the, the piece is listed and people comment? Some say he, he, he's buffoonish. He's embarrassing and should be more uh, careful how he speaks. <laughs> 
and then others have have denounced that view as as being ridiculous and and, and class based, and uh, you know. Uh, some folks have ridiculed his, his colorful speaking style, and um, I guess you would say his Ebonics accent. Um, there, there are many, many questions that have been provoked by the incident, of course, uh, aside from uh, Brother Ramsey's um, appearance in, on the scene. But the question is really how, how many uh, women altogether? I mean, uh, from from what reports are, that this woman, uh, uh, M- 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 Marcella Knight, uh, the the other one, the, the the first one who was who was captured Michelle Knight the first one who was captured and, uh, and the oldest one said there was someone there when she came and that person disappeared so now they're wondering about um, how many people were there and were some uh, were some disposed of uh, in, in a murderous way I mean that kind of question is is uh, very, very high on, on the investigators' list. And uh, how, how were they restrained for all of these years? They, they say there were, there were ropes and chains in, in the house, and I suppose that that's how it happened. But uh, the women wandered out um, after Amanda escaped, from, from what I understand. The women simply wandered out on their own even before the police got there or, or as the police were arriving. So were they restrained then? And if they weren't, why hadn't they tried to escape before? Are there any records of the births of, uh, of Amanda's child, who allegedly uh, it, it belongs to Ariel um, uh, Castro, one of the men? Or the, the, it turns out the only man charged. At first they had charged his brothers, Pedro and Oneda, but uh, they, the charges against them have been dropped. So apparently it was only him. Uh, and uh, were there any records of the births of uh, her child? And um, why? Uh, one of the questions w- w- that I had wanted to wanted to know w- were why um, uh, why were the brothers arrested? Well, it appears that um, they were they were falsely arrested, or evidence ha- has been revealed that that um, absolved them of any connection to this. Um, why didn't Amanda or, or the other girls attempt to escape previously? Um, uh, you know that that's another question, and those are only some 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 questions. There are many others, of course. Uh, but the main thing is uh, they're free, they're safe. A lot of folks thought that they were dead because that is generally how these kinds of cases wind up, uh, and. So there's a lot of there's a lot of relief, especially around Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland has experienced some horrific kinds of uh, crimes lately. There was a guy in East Cleveland, I think it was last year, who had uh, they found 11 bodies on his property. He had killed 11 women, uh, and that was an astounding crime that really shocked the city. And uh, this is something I guess is is uh, is something that relieves the city. A lot of people are, are quite um, uh, are quite joyous about this, and there was you know like a pep rally, and, and crowds have been gathering and whatnot outside of the house. And uh, it 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 is it is a, a pleasant story, except for the fact that this guy. Um, did such a despicable thing and got away with it for so long. It's so incredible. Now there are there are there are um, accounts of of people seeing weird things go on in in the uh, in the vicinity and and at in the backyard of the house. So one one woman says she saw a naked woman leashed wandering around the backyard. Um, and didn't call the police after seeing that. I guess she figured it was some kind of a, you know odd sexual game, uh, whatever. But she didn't call the police, and that, you know, so there's a there, there's a mixture of relief and, and wonder at, at how something like this could go on for so long. What do you think about it? I know you've been hearing a lot about it during the day, and I'm sure you have some some ideas that you want to throw out there. Well, Israel and the neocons are still doing all they can to push the U.S. into yet another military incursion into the troubled region of the uh, Middle East. 
this time Syria. Israel has taken it upon itself to violate Syrian sovereignty by bombing military installations within the country on the pretext that arms are being shipped to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, missiles, uh, Fatah missiles, kind of Scud-like missiles. Um, although Hezbollah is reportedly very well armed and no need of those particular missiles, especially now that they're not involved in any kind of skirmish, uh, whereas Syria is deeply involved in a skirmish and would, it would seem foolish for them to be um, shipping away their uh, supplies of arms when they're in dire need of arms against a, a very dedicated rebellion um, that is being financed by the petrol monarchies of, of the Gulf uh, states and, of course, uh, the United States and, and other interested parties, Britain, some some you know some NATO forces some NATO money, uh, they're trying to arm trying to figure out who they can arm in Syria, um, and uh, you know th those are some of some of the options that are being considered. Moreover, it, it, it's Israel that that is bolstering the disputed claim that that the uh, that Assad regime has used chemical weapons on quote its own people. And that phrase, you know, always amazes me, or amuses me, let me say. Because if rebels are seeking to overthrow a legitimate government, any attempt to rebuff them would be an attack on its own people. Because that's who's launching the attacks on the government. If, for example, if uh, some militia groups in this country decided to, um, to, you know, to do what they're crowing about, attack the government, uh, you know, fully armed and all of that, or, or, or stop the jackbooted thugs of the FBI or, or the, or the um, uh, alcohol to, uh, ATF. Uh, if they would decide to do that and, and they were rebuffed, it would be an attack on our own people. Um, when when uh, the Clinton administration sent in uh, – Sent in weapons, sent in bombs and whatnot to, to, to take care of uh, Koresh uh, in, in Waco, Texas. Um, that, those were our own people, right? And we incinerated them. When we incinerated the MOVE people in Philadelphia uh, in 85, I think it was, that was our own people. So this whole thing about our own people is, is a canard that a lot of folks throw up. They threw it up in Libya as well. They said he was getting ready to attack his own people, but it was his own people that were trying to overthrow the government. Who else are you going to retaliate against? Who else are you going to protect yourself against? Your own people. So when you hear that, be, be wary, please, be wary. Still, President Obama said if evidence emerged showing chemical weapons were used, it would be a red line that uh, would provoke this country, it would oblige the U.S., to get more deeply involved in the conflict, either by sending more arms to the rebels or aiding them with, with uh, overt, overtly aiding them with, 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 you know, with air power and other kinds of uh, arms. Um, and this, as far as I'm concerned, this is precisely the wrong thing to do. And let us all hope that the Obama, Obama administration won't let itself be uh, bullied in, into yet another damaging Middle Eastern adventure. Um, and, and, and this, in fact, this is, is as the UN is casting doubt on whether it's the Assad regime that is guilty of using chemical weapons and throwing suspicion on the rebel forces, um, that they may be the ones using these chemical weapons rather than the Assad regime, because they know that if any evidence is revealed about the use of chemical weapons, they will benefit from it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very important that we consider, I think, and we haven't considered this enough, the sectarian nature of this conflict in Syria and the, and the destabilizing consequences of a rebel victory. Um, you know, there, there is, there is uh, the regime of Assad, which is basically a Shia regime, Alawite. But that, that's a sect of the, of the Shia branch of Islam. And there's a low-intensity, I guess you can say, civil war within Islam 
uh, between Shia and Sunni. You see it in Iraq. Sectarian tensions are strong. Um, there have been a lot, many more deaths this year uh, due to these sectarian tensions in, in Iraq. Many bombings, suicide bombings of Shia, uh, okay, you know, Shia celebrations and other kinds of uh, celebrations by the dominant regime in, in Iraq. We see it, um, of course, we, we see it in Syria. We see it in Afghanistan. Um, we, we, we see it in, in um, Libya and, and, and other, other places uh, uh, in the region. And, uh, of course, Israel would, would gain the most from these kinds of conflicts, these uh, internecine con uh, conflicts at, at, at the well-known Yigon plan that Israel has proposed. It desperately seeks to balkanize these nations, that is, help, to divide them, uh, and, and divide them internally around the Jewish state. And so far it appears, appears to have worked, you know, Libya, Egypt, Iraq. Syria was always high on the list, as was Lebanon, another uh, nation uh, riven by sectarian strife. So the Yigan plan apparently is performing as designed. Meanwhile, those same neocons who are clamoring for Syrian engagement are once again making noises about what happened when a group of protesters attacked the U.S. Uh, embassy in the Libyan city uh, of Benghazi, the city that gave birth to the, an the anti-Qaddafi movement. Um, it would be really hilarious that they would still be flogging this, this, this useless issue were it not so despicable and transparently bogus. Sole objective of these guys, these yowling yahoos, is to embarrass the Obama administration. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that the Obama folks are clean on this. It does need to be embarrassed, but not the way they are trying to do it, not on this particular issue. It needs to be embarrassed for allowing a regime change assault on Libya in the first place. Um, there, were no, there was no reason. It was uh, hyped up. This so-called humanitarian intervention was something that was hyped up. Uh, the primary objection to, to Gaddafi was coming from Benghazi and the Islamists in Benghazi who had always had it in for Gaddafi because of his defiance of Sharia, as far as they were concerned, with his Green Book. They considered him some, somewhat of a, of a uh, uh, someone who, who was violating the, the laws of, uh, of Islam to a certain extent, shirk. And, uh, and, and now we look, look at what's happening in uh, Libya. So apparently this country wants the same thing. In, in these other countries. And, and, you know, as I've been saying lately, I think we need to begin to understand what the United States is up to and the West and, and particularly Israel. I think this country is attempting to divide uh, the world of Islam, the nation of Islam, so to speak. Uh, the, the Shia and, and Sunni rivalry, they are attempting to uh, exacerbate the differences, the, 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 the tensions that keep those, those different beliefs apart, those different sects apart, and um, those different versions of Islam apart. And you, you have to ask yourself, why not? If, if, it's, if they consider uh, this a war against the, the Islamist who uh, look at the country, this country as, as, uh, as the crusader, the, the, the crusader that wants to overthrow Islam and wants to despoil Islam, uh, then what, what this country, the best strategy for the U.S. is to divide and conquer. It's always done that with its enemies, and this, is, this would be, you know, a strategy that is, that is not at all alien <laughs> to the U.S. So, if we begin, I think, to look at it in that way, it would clarify a lot of things. Uh, you never hear that, that kind of uh, uh, mission um, pr pronounced explicitly in any of the, the foreign policy discussions. But I think it is something that is implicit and is absolutely apparent if you really look 
deeper into all of the adventures this country has been involved in, it will begin to become clear, I think, that one of the things that the U.S. and the West wants to do is to keep Islam divided, keep it on its heels, keep it looking over its shoulder at internal problems rather than um, being able to mobilize against the Crusader West. And of course, that mobilization against the Crusader West is only one very small faction of Islam, the Salafis who have a certain kind of animus against uh, the West. It's not, it's the, the, it's not the, the worldwide expression of Islam, which is primarily a peaceful outlook, a peaceful perspective, live and let live kind of thing. Um, but, but I, you know, as I say, I think, I think this country is attempting to divide and conquer. It looks like um, Mark Sanford, former governor of South Carolina, who transformed the Appalachian Trail into a metaphor for cheating on your wife, was elected to a congressional seat in the state of South Carolina. He was elected, um, defying expectations. Uh, he beat back a solid challenge uh, from, from Elizabeth Colbert Bush, the uh, 58-year-old businesswoman who um, is also the sister of comedian Stephen Colbert, who calls himself Colbert, is Colbert. Um, the, the final percentage of the vote was 54 to 45, well, significant victory for Sanford uh, over the neophyte challenger because this was her first, uh, her first run. So he, he, he pushed back, and uh, I guess you can call it a comeback. Um, it, you know, a lot of folks are saying, hey, you know, it shows that um, conservatives believe in redemption or something. Or uh, what it really shows is that it's very difficult to, to elect a Democrat in South Carolina. That's what it really shows. Many groups have mobilized to protest the designation of Asata Shakur, a terrorist. We talked about that last week. Um, she was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted terrorist list, an absurd designation, completely at variance with, with, with the facts of her case. Um, and many, many folks are mobilizing now to make that very clear. It, it, it's so clear that it, it's almost, uh, it, it, seems, it, it seems incredible that the FBI would go along with, with such a designation. Uh, simply at the behest of the New Jersey police. Uh, you know, a lot of folks think it's because of uh, Christie's relationship with Obama, you know, and, and he's uh, pushing for it, uh, and, and uh, other kinds of political motives. But it really is a, um, something that should be reversed as soon as possible because it is totally inappropriate. Uh, Willie Jerome Manning. Scheduled to be put to death on Tuesday uh, in, in Mississippi for, for murdering two college students. Um, he was granted um, a, a stay uh, of execution by, by the state Supreme Court after the U.S. Department of Justice sent lawyers and officials involved in the case several letters disavowing the, the certainty, the degree of certainty that was previously expressed by an FBI forensic expert at the man's trial. Um, it was con concerning hair and, and where the proper DNA tests were conducted. These DNA tests could absolve this brother or it could confirm his, his, uh, his guilt. But it should be done. And the FBI made that, the Just Justice Department made that case. At first, the, the, uh, the state of Mississippi refused to hear it. Um, but after, uh, I, I guess, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, convincing on, on the part of other law enforcement agencies, uh, the Supreme Court decided to go ahead and do it. And it came just four hours before the scheduled execution of, uh, of the brother, 44 years old, um, and he's a black man, and uh, he was, he was, uh, he was charged, he, he was going to be executed uh, for, for killing uh, these two students who were white. Um, so, you know, good, good move by the uh, 
Justice Department to force the Supreme Court or to convince the Supreme Court to, to take this action. Uh, what other issues strike your fancy? Just give us a call and let us know. We can talk about it. 773-591-1690, Give us a call and let's get started. But first, we uh, are going to take a break and we'll be right back. And we're back. It is 736. Make sure you go to WVON.com and, and view our current video, which is President Obama delivers commencement address at Ohio State University. Participate in the Daily Listener Poll while you're there. Today's question is uh, Charles Ramsey's heroism being overshadowed by the ridiculing. A, yes, B, no. Simple. Simple alternatives. Um... There were the, the, the poll question results from the, from the previous poll. Do you support paying taxes for online sales? Um, the, the answers were 74% of you said no. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I can't afford high sales tax. And 25%, 25.6% said yes, more revenue for the states. Um, also, when you go to WVON.com, uh, click the photos, um, 274, 274 images from Savage Photography from WVON's 50th anniversary gala weekend. You would enjoy the sights were you to do this. So make sure you do it. Um, okay, let's go to the phones and find out what is on your mind. Steve, good evening. You're on the Talk of Chicago. How are you? Fine. Thank you for taking my call. Yes, and, and I think you raise an interesting point with regard to American foreign policy. Um, and if we want to use a starting point, say, in the post-World War II era, it has been highly problematic. Uh, where we might disagree, and this is only if I'm reading what you're saying correctly, um, is that I don't tend to subscribe to the idea that we were some sort of master chess players, i.e. Bobby Fischer, moving the pieces around a board with an end game that eludes everyone but ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, the foreign policy choices that we've made, including the wars that we've been involved in, the regimes that we've supported, the policies and so forth, have come back t uh, to bite us, a sort of blowback, as it were, mm -hmm. as it's referred to, uh, all too often, such that it indicates a really short-sightedness in terms of American foreign policy, rather than, again, some grand chess master playing a game where, you know, we, in the end, win, uh, win everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, you know, we have repeatedly supported regimes which have turned out to be totalitarian, and then somehow in our minds, and again, this is because I think uh, the United States has tended to operate with this sort of uh, childish um, dichotomy uh, of the world in which there's a black and a white, there's a good and a bad. Mm -hmm. So if the Soviet Union was, were the bad guys and we were the good guys, and the Afghans were fighting the Soviet Union, then by all means, there would be no reason not to arm them. Mm -hmm. uh, they must be on our side. <laughs> right. <laughs> not that, thinking, binary, that binary uh, Exactly. And not thinking for a moment that there might be a few other sides to the world other than ours and the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. and, and this, I think, is the case uh, with regard to the, the issues in the Middle East and in terms of our involvement with these nations. Uh, the, the reality is that unlike other wars, which I would argue have, were much more simple, First World War, Second World War, and so forth, especially the Second World War, um, we are expecting somehow that we are going to support one side and that uh, the day after tomorrow it's going to look like Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And that we, were, we, we would be welcomed as the French welcomed us into Paris <laughs> right. as liberators. And that simply isn't the case. Uh, the reality is that there are only bad choices in many parts of the world. And the, the question is, which one of the bad choices are you going to decide to back? And uh, no one can convince me with any degree of certainty that, you know, we back the right people in Libya, we back the right people in Egypt, we back the right people um, when it comes to Syria, mm -hmm. um, because they are by no means any lovers of the United States no. and our policy and our culture and so forth and so on. The, but, you know, one, but, 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 Steve, one, one of the ironies of, of the Syrian thing is that the, the regime seems to be more friendly to, to, to forces that are in line with, with the ideas of the United States than, than their rebels are. Exactly. You know, the, 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 exactly. The, the, secular. Secular, and, and secular right, and, 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 and ecumenical. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes there are actually secular totalitarian regimes, yes, right. such, as, such as Syria, even in Iraq. Iraq was, was secular and totalitarian. Exactly. We've, we've created for ourselves a far greater foreign policy problem now that the forces that are, uh, but that are in power in Iran are, can now support those that are in, in power in Iraq. Right. right <laughs> so rather right. than dividing our exactly enemies, we decided right. to create an environment in which we could have a united uh, force a right against us. Yes. So, uh, I, again, I mean, I think that we are tremendously short-sighted in, in terms of these issues. There is one glimmer of hope, and that is that in the age of mass media, in which we live in a global society, that young people who represent a disproportional number of persons in this region um, are much more inclined to view Western ideas and global c- concepts as something that they, uh, they are accepting. They tend to be less inclined uh, to lean towards uh, totalitarian and theocratic but, regimes. But, but once, once the, once the, uh, the uh, ball starts to roll, roll Steve, I'm afraid that these Islamists are the ones who who, who uh, become the dominant forces. And, yeah, yes, and they, the, yes, liberal, the liberal forces always appear to be weak and, and right. equivocated. And that's, and that's part because, uh, because they tend to be segmented. Yes. And, and uh, the, for those Islamic forces, they tend to be run by people who are older, who are more mature, more sophisticated. And more so, dedicated. And, and, and they have a goal, which is pretty simplistic. Oh, absolutely. And I would argue that it's analogous to the 1960s, in which you had a, a left in this country that was protesting uh, the social order, that was protesting the Vietnam War, but they were by no means organized. You know, the old right. adage was that, you know, you really didn't need to do anything with regard to the left except let them uh, line themselves up in a circular firing squad. They'll <laughs> exactly kill each other. Right, exactly. So, uh, yeah, and lastly, I did want to point, I mean, I, uh, though I think it's a story that, you know, we're, we're spending too much time covering this Cleveland story. Mm. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, the ABC this evening had a story in which uh, they declared that one of the young ladies who the young lady who gave birth to the child gave birth in a blow up swimming pool mm-hmm. there in the home right. so apparently the child was born there in the home and did you hear about uh, abortions that the other uh, some of the other uh, captives yes were? exactly i mean and not abortions that were right, carried right, uh, right. in a clinic exactly. uh, these were the most abhorrent ways that you could think of in terms of inducing an abortion so mm-hmm. i mean it's it is hard to believe um, if there is one thought that is a little bit frightening, and that is that all of a sudden now, um, a couple of the news stations today have talked about how important it is that the public and be involved. And it's great that we had a hero here and that he got involved. Um, I would hate to see, however, a world in which uh, our neighbors are climbing over our backyard fences. <laughs> you know, there you go. That's true. Absolutely. So always, yeah, not always, we're always important to look and look at the, those uh, those unintended consequences. Exactly. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Steve. All right, let's go to uh, Fahim. Hey, my brother, how are you, sir? Hey, hey, Salim. All right, how you doing? Who is well, this? Is this Fahim or Fadim? Yeah, brother, I, I, we haven't chatted in a oh, while. Fahim, yes, sir, it's you. Yeah, okay. But obviously the the incident in uh, Ohio warrants um, that we analyze it. And what's, of course, what's your take? What's your take on that? Well, one of the things that I've noticed is everyone is criticizing the black man who was obviously a hero. But what I've noticed is black people don't realize that we were enslaved the same way for hundreds of years. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, this is a this is deep, man, because uh you know, when white people endure some kind of trauma, I've noticed that they are uh given some type of uh of therapeutic uh uh pathological definitions such as post-traumatic stress disorder or Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, these terms are, are part of our everyday vocabulary. Okay, yeah. we all know what Stockholm Syndrome is, and quite frankly, well, that's... Man, many of us do, but a lot of us don't, man. A lot of folks don't. Explain what it is to folks who may not Well, understand. it's when you become sympathetic towards your captors, or the people who enslaved you, mm-hmm. okay? And, uh, you know, it's happened so many times. This, 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 you know, that's some kind of a sexual uh, 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 classification. Mm. I think they call it a uh, 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 bondage or something, mm. but it's it's my point being it further uh, d- uh, proves the 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 uh, Willie Lynch letter. You know, black people didn't believe oh, you, you mean, the authenticity. You mean, you mean, you mean of, that some of the women the women seem to be compliant is is, is the point you're making, right? Rather, no, what I'm saying is when black people criticize the the hero more than uh, the, the, the 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 those devils. 
yeah, those people, that's witchcraft, man. That's what that is. And see, we, you know, we're into the, uh, you know, post-racial society, but no, man, evil is real. And that's what that was. And, of course, uh, what black people have endured as long as we've been in this country has been evil. But we, it's been an ongoing struggle to to overcome the like I was saying the the post traumatic effects of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of us being in bondage the same way those three girls were in uh, uh, enslaved for uh, ten years okay but like they say uh, uh, in order for evil to triumph good men must do nothing so I just wanted to salute. The, the 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 you know that brother Charles, uh, Charles Ramsey, Ramsey. Mm-hmm. and you know coincidentally his name Ramsey is the name of a uh, ancient Egyptian black general. Yeah, Ramses. Ramses. I think it's in the Bible. So you know he he was heroic. He was strong, and like he said, uh, you know, not too many people would have done that. And he, he you know he even he he understood. If, mm. You know, when a white girl runs into the waiting arms of a black man, it's something. Something really strange is going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think uh, 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 what this represents is it, it helps us understand what black people have been through. It serves to substantiate that the Willie Lynch letter <laughs> Boy, was saw, very it's real, really man. Something how we, it's something how we can we can interpret every event to apply. And and, and it does. I mean, for example, I I I I, I would say that. Um, when, when the brother made the the statement about when he when he saw a white girl run into the arms of a black man, he knew something was wrong. I would I would I would um, make that uh, I would align that with what happened to white America when Pr- President Obama was running for president. That this country had to be in pretty bad shape for a lot of white people to vote for a black man. Well, uh, the, the 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 reality is, and, and you understand history, uh, you know. This country would never have made it, thrived and flourished and prospered were it not for black people. And, Salim, you know enough history of Europe to know that were it not for black men and black people uh, rescuing whites out of the dark ages, okay? Uh, 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 Whites thought the earth was flat. Black people, we taught whites uh, the constellations. Uh, going back to ancient Egypt, we taught whites the the the, uh, the, the wheel. We taught whites how to uh, 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 domesticate animals. The horse. Black people domesticated the horse. Obviously, the ancient Egyptians understood engineering. Uh, in the movie Robin Hood, Morgan Freeman plays Robin Hood and pulls out a telescope. And Robin no, he, Hood he, Morgan, didn't even know what a telescope was. Mor- telescope. Mor- Morgan Freeman wasn't Robin Hood. He was uh, he was uh, uh, one of Robin Hood's aides. And- yeah, pardon me, pardon mm-hmm. me. When the when the Moors conquered Spain, right. and of course one of the technologies that uh, black Moors had was the telescope, which was made out of melting yeah, but sand. You know problem, and I don't know if, if but, but, but but Fahim, you know the problem. I I, I agree that that is that is the way it evolved. That's the way knowledge evolved. Um, but, but so, so then how would you, uh, how do, if we had that scientific jump on Europe, how do you explain how Europe jumped ahead of us during that period and then use that scientific knowledge, uh, to, 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 uh, increase their dominance over us and exploit our resources? Well, the, the answer is, is, is rather simple. We, black people, we were not a militant people. We understood uh, the philosophy or the religion, if you will, of peace. And I think that's the frontier that the world is on now. Oh, well, ho, 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 brother. The, 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 the same caliphate that, that, the, that you say the Moors uh, uh, headed to, to overrun Europe during the— to change them from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance, um, was a warlike movement. It was a movement of conquest, not peace. It wasn't no, a peace I, I would take issue with that because Europe was in the Dark Ages at the time, and of course, if you uh, notice the, the 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 knight in shining armor, the Crusades, uh, Europe was 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 just in absolute. 
state a state of chaos because of, like I said, and like you just said, warfare. And this is typified by the knight in shining armor. Uh, my point being, white people have a very long history of war. Mm. Very long history. Black people, we love peace. In other words, the, the, all you have to do is look at the evolution of the weapon. We know that uh, when whites began to travel, they went to China, and they learned about the kite. Okay, so the Chinese understood aerodynamics. The Chinese also had gunpowder that was being used for fireworks. Okay, whites turned the, the gunpowder into weapons. And, of course, we all saw uh, the evolution of the, uh, 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 the atomic bomb during World War II. So, but we're at a point now where the world is realizing, wait a minute, Rodney King said it best, can we all just get along? Mm. So my point being, you know, uh, the pathologies of white men are now being exposed and ex uh, explored and discussed like we're talking now. But at the same time, black, you know, see, we've, what lessons are we learning from all of this? And like I said, this thing proves the, how real the Willie Lynch letter was. White men sat around. Well, the Willie, Willie Lynch letter has been widely disproved, man, by, it, it, by scholars. It, how is it disproven? When, by scholars when, who say that, that it, it, it's impossible for it to have existed, or is it, it's impossible for someone named Willie Lynch with that kind of uh, history to have written something like that at okay, that time. Okay, the, 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 the name... Willie is, of course, short for William. Mm -hmm. William Lynch is a is a is. I remember someone told me that they they had issues with why would white men be standing along the riverbank talking about you know how to how to uh, enslave black people, and I had to describe or explain to this brother that. It, it, back in those days, before we had highways and uh, 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 cars, all trade and commerce, everything took place along the riverbanks. Okay? See, a lot of times, black people, we don't know history. So what does that mean? What is that about, the riverbank? That's, is that, that, you, know, you mean that's where the Willie Lynch letter was, was uh, dictated or, so, or something? Supposedly, yes, along well, no, the no, riverbank. No, along, uh, Fahim, uh, let, me river. let me just suggest you, you just do just a little... A little um, I hate to make this guy. I don't want to seem condescending, but just do a little research on, on the Willie Lynch letter, man. You'll find that there's not, I mean, there, there certainly is a, a truth in it. It, it. it speaks to a larger truth on how to, how to manage certain kinds of populations. But in, in terms of it being an actual letter, there's really, there's really no evidence of that, man. In fact, the evidence is quite the contrary. All right. Let me, let me my final point is mm -hmm. no one can deny that what those men were doing to those uh, three girls. It, it, that was Willie Lynch. Well, well apparent, apparently it was just one man, and he was Latino. He was well, Puerto you know what? This has been. What about the man in Austria? He had his own daughter and had children. Where this has been in the news numerous times. All right, my brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, Fahim. I hear you, bro. Thank you. Um, I, I just I, I caution us from, from getting too too much from this, from, from making too much of this. Um, it, it's a, it is an aber, a serious aberration. I mean, it's so aberrational, it's almost hard to believe that this guy could do something like that. Now, I don't think there's a pattern that you can, you can draw uh, um, on, on this particular crime to make any kind of larger conclusion about uh, someone's in, you know, nature or anything like that. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Rico, hey, man. Hey, sir. How you doing? I'm checking in even on the road. Pardon love me? your show. Uh, I wanted to discuss really quick, and it's kind of a shame that with Jesse Jackson Jr., I, I hope that he does not get any prison time because um, he didn't take money directly from a taxpayer, per se. I think that's more of an IRS issue than anything else. Mm -hmm. If you took money from your campaign funds and did not uh, yes. declare yes. them on your income. Yes. But I know the same thing happened with Alderman Beavers, and he's going to probably be getting some time for that, too, but I think there should be a better way maybe to force him to maybe do public speaking. I agree, to do man. some things more in the community to yes, educate young people on how to not get a felony conviction. Yes, sir. I think you're right, man. I, I think it's a ter it would be a terrible waste of, of everything to put that brother in jail. I met him personally several times, you know, provided security through an airport for him. Mm -hmm. And I think that he had a, a very talented young man, had a lot to offer. And, you know, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes, uh, and apparently he, he he apparently he actually suffers from a, a mental disorder, and and I think that that needs to be taken into consideration. 
No, you're you're so right. Mm-hmm. I just think that I wish that the judge would, you know, for I would rather him do community service and go around to every high school in the city of Chicago and teach these young men that when you get a felony, you can't work anymore as well. You, you don't have the opportunities that other people have, and maybe it'll kind of steer some of these young people into doing something more positive because then he can let them know it happened to him, and he was a congressman. So it definitely can happen to you if you're out there committing crimes. And I'll let you go ahead, Salim. All right, man. Thank you, Rico. Appreciate it, my brother. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I I think it would be a waste to, to put uh, um, Congressman Jackson in jail. Um, <clears throat> but but you know that this 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 whole Willie Lynch thing. I mean, uh, it, it, it's interesting how uh, it has captured so many folks with with uh, pretty. Um, easily understood methods of, of dividing and conquer. I mean, it, it's a pretty venerable tactic that has been used throughout history. It doesn't, it's not really unique to African Americans or, or to enslaved Africans. Um, it is, it is an uh, erstwhile uh, and, and very ha- uh, hallowed technique. Um, and, and, uh, a similar, there's a similar letter out now about some some hip hop cats, some hip hop executives meeting and deciding that they wanted to increase, they they wanted to invest in in private prisons, and so they decided to um, to play music that is you know heavy on gangster rap, uh, you know the, the Chief Keef kind of stuff that 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 is being that is being popularized in Chicago, this kind of uh, um, drill Chicago music. Um, and uh, and uh, and that these guys are conspiring to um, to to increase the prison population by putting this music out, and they had this this meeting in which they came to that decision. Uh, and, and there's a letter uh, being circulated on the internet that alleges this, uh, that alleges these guys did it. I think that is very similar, very akin to the Willie Lynch letter. Uh, that letter has been disproved by people who say that it really isn't, um, it, it couldn't have been what it is purported to be. Yet, the issues that the letter points out that, um, you know, young black men are, are their own worst enemy in terms of the leading cause of death being homicide and all of that, and how gangster rap tends to ex- exacerbate those kinds of tensions and, and, and glorify that lifestyle, there's no doubt about that as well. Um, and so the, 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 this letter alleges that that is intentional. It's an intentional attempt by these record executives to increase the prison population. Uh, and although, you know, it makes sense, it has logic to it, uh, and it, by, it, it, it uh, feeds into this kind of conspiratorial notion that we are at the beck and call of, of, of you know, that we are simply stimulus response organisms. All you have to do is put a certain stimulus out there and we respond in a predictable way and that they can judge us by, they can control our behavior by that kind of uh, activity. Well, um, that's not the way things are. We, we are much more complicated than that. There's something to it, of course, but we are much more complicated than that. And I see Dr. Bell has called and I want to hear what this brother has to say, but we don't want to talk to you, Dr. Bell, before the uh, top of the hour because we want time to expand on your views and we will do that right after we come back 807 on the talk of Chicago 1690 WBON our number is 591 1690 give us a call let us know what's on your mind we're going right to the phones Dr. Bell good evening my brother how are you sir I'm, I'm good I heard you Yes. Driving home from dinner, and I'm like, I have got to call him. All right, all right. Thank you, my brother. What's on your mind? Well, you know, I was I was listening to uh, some of the comments. It was nice to hear that uh, black people kind of think alike. I was on the WGN this morning, and one of the anchors asked me what I thought about the captivity of these women. Uh-huh. And you know what kind of people would do something like that? Uh-huh. Were they were they narcissistic? Were they mentally ill? Were they? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, that's really nothing new <laughs> if you think about it. Uh-huh. You know, innocent black men are being 
captured all the time and held in Cook County Jail Ooh. without bond until they can prove that they're innocent. Mm. Uh, I said, they didn't think about slavery. You know, I said, so this is not anything. Yeah, new. yeah, all right. Well, well, so how did they respond to that particular take that you brought? <laughs> I knew that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> Kind of deer in the headlight, <laughs> you know. Kind of deer in the headlight. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And then we went from there. I, did, you, did you keep the headlights on? Yeah, you know, you know me. <laughs> I, I put them on bright. <laughs> um, and then they moved into this uh, ebook that I did around uh, overcoming prejudice at work. Mm-hmm. Uh, that me, myself, and a, a colleague uh, at Harvard wrote about micro-insults and microaggressions mm-hmm. and how, you know, people will, and this is Chester Pierce's work mm-hmm. uh, out of Harvard back I, in I, the I'm, I'm in a little familiar seven. with him, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I know you, uh, you're, you're an educated brother, so I would expect you, yes, sir. Thank to, you be, to be familiar. Uh, but Chet actually did research on micro-insults and microaggressions and proved that well, a lot of times white people, because of their stereotyping of black people, uh, are subtly infringing on their space, time, energy, and mobility. Mm-hmm. And when you, I think the example I gave was, I remember one time I was in line at a hotel uh, getting ready to check in, and I was waiting my turn, and this white dude just jumped in front of me, walked up and jumped in front of me. So I yelled at him. <laughs> I said, hey, what does it look like? I'm waiting for a boat. So, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see you standing there. How could you miss me? You people are so sensitive because when you <laughs> when you when you when you bring it to someone's attention, mm-hmm. they immediately think that you're touchy about it because it doesn't happen to them every time they're around uh, white people, right? Um, and and, and, so that, and they yeah. just they just assume that it, there's nothing out of out of the ordinary when they do. Oh it. yeah, no, mm-hmm. that white privilege is a given. Yes. Indeed. As is monocultural ethnocentrism, yes, sir. which has disturbed me tremendously because I suspect that the Asians kind of knew that exercise increased neurogenesis, that is, brain cells growing. Uh, but we were so arrogant in our Western culture that we couldn't possibly think that, <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, and, of course, black people have been <laughs> rocking people since time immemorial, and that, of course, creates cerebral development, yes, as does uh, some of the massaging and oiling techniques of mm-hmm. West Africa. Uh, uh, the but, an- you know, anointing, the, uh, those anointing techniques, right? Yeah. Anointing with oil and stuff, yeah? Yeah, but we're, we're so arrogant in the West that we couldn't possibly believe that these uh, practices of people of color could have any value. That's right, man. Very true. Very uh, true. So, t- t- Dr. How, how do you? How do you? Um, what, what's your take on, on the way uh, uh, Clarence Ram, uh, uh, Charles Ramsey is being treated? Or, or being... <laughs> I fell out laughing <laughs> when that brother said, "What a white woman, what a pretty <laughs> white woman." So I said, "I took that out." <laughs> uh, Running into the arms of a black man, you know something is seriously wrong. And the brother had such a nice, ordinary, profound way of telling the truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, it was it was just it was really it was really nice to see him. Refreshing. He's indeed. clearly a wise brother. Even 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 uh, in spite of himself. In spite of yes, he, he's a little <laughs> He's a little rambunctious. Yes, yes, yes. But but you no, know, I, 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 you're right. I, I, you can see that not just the the wisdom, but the goodness of the brother. You know, you can oh, tell he's yeah, a good no, cat. He, you know, rock solid brother. Yes, rock sir. solid brother. But you know, uh, so I mean, the one thing that has struck me that I just want to put out there. Okay. Um, I think you probably knew that I was doing HIV prevention research in Durban, South Africa. I had, where, I had heard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, where 40% of the Zulu people were HIV 40, positive. 40%, man? I didn't 40, know it was that 40, high. Oh, yeah, it's that high. Wow. It's that high. 
Well, it turns out that 6% of the white South Africans were HIV positive. Mm. But even more interesting was that only 1% of the East Indian South African people Is that right? were HIV positive. Mm. So you say, well, you know, what is that? Well, I, I didn't fully understand it, although the research intervention that we did actually sort of created the same sort of protective factors that the East Indians had. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't fully understand it because I tended to be a little slow mm-hmm. until I went to uh, Canada to give a talk. And while I was in Canada, what I found out was that <clears throat> 19 out of 20 children in their juvenile detention centers have fetal alcohol exposure. Is that in, in thought, Canada? Is that is that be, is that uh, uh, because of the fact that they they are natives? Uh, that they are they are yes. Mm-hmm. They are Native American mm-hmm. people. Okay. And I thought, what is that? You know. Now I know that on uh, reservations, <clears throat> the only businesses. Well, I guess the casinos are thriving. But prior to that, the only businesses that were thriving were the liquor stores. Mm. Now, you know, that sort of paralleled my experience in Chicago. Uh-huh. Because there are essentially five institutions in the black community. Black churches, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, payday loan stores. Mm-hmm. Ribbon chicken shacks, uh, hair care and nail parlors, and uh, liquor stores. So I was, I was thinking, I was like, what is that? So, but then I realized that in 1840, the Canadian people took, captured the children of the Native Americans, put them in boarding schools. You know this. Yes, uh, yes, I do. Beat them if they spoke their language, ate their food, sang their songs, prayed to their God. They did the same thing Put in them, Australia with the Aborigines. And the same with the same in Australia and New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Put them back after 19 years or 20 years or 21 years of destroying their culture in these people. Mm-hmm. And then wonder why. They are having so much difficulty with suicide, homicide, and substance abuse. Mm-hmm. Well, if you think about what the Afrikaners did to the Zulu people, they did the exact same thing. They destroyed those people's culture. Mm-hmm. Now, it's fascinating to me when I think about the East Indians in Durban, South Africa, you talk about a tight-knit community that protects their children and tells them what to wear, who to pray to, how to eat, uh, how to treat everybody in your immediate circle. Is it relig- religious, religiously homo- homogen- gene- you know, ho- homogeneous as well? Well, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but uh, you know, culture protects people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. And, you know, there, there are people walking around, and this is a fine distinction, um, who argue that black people suffer from post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't have it. I doubt that you have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I doubt that black people have it. But I think rather than focusing on a deficit, mm-hmm. I think that what black people, Native American people, and Aboriginal people have is an absence of culture. Yes, sir. I call it a lack of cultural capital. Yes. Uh, Malcolm, of course, talks about cultural imperialism. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what, it's the lack of protective factors. Yeah, yeah. I hear that, man. I hear that. Which uh, puts us at so much risk. But fortunately, some of us um, still have it. And I, and I think it's hard for us to see because I don't know. I think it's difficult for a fish to see water. Uh-huh, because they're in and it. So I, 
Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's hard for black people to see what culture we have. Mm-hmm. Because white people certainly don't understand it, and they certainly disrespect it. Uh, as you know, I'm fond of wearing hats, because growing up in Chicago, brothers always had on brims. Yes, sir. <laughs> New York, too. Hat. Mm-hmm. New York, too. Oh, New York? Oh. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> New York, too. Right, maybe everywhere, because I see brothers with hats. When, you know, I, when I was in the service, man, that, that's that was uh, you know a, a, pr- a pretty universal uh, uh, characteristic with, with brothers. Oh, I'm sure, mm-hmm. but if but white people question it mm-hmm. and think you're being rude and disrespectful, but if it was a yarmulke, <laughs> dig it, it would be okay. Yes, sir. And so I, I refuse to. I'm, I'm writing a chapter or something, and. Then, in there, I'm talking about culture-bound syndromes. I'm talking about sleep paralysis falling out. I think to some extent, uh, church spirituality is a trauma magnet for black people. So mm-hmm. that's where we go to be reborn and healed. And I always wanted to heal from what? And of course, there's cultural trauma, there's actual trauma trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, I think there's also substance abuse. Yes. Uh, self medication, man. Self medication, uh, a poor man's vacation. Yes. Uh, but I, you know, I don't, I don't think. Again, that if you if you look at this whole notion of fetal alcohol, mm-hmm. fetal alcohol exposure causes the four most common problems that children have, which, which are is speech, speech and language uh-huh. deficits. Specific learning disorders, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity, and mild intellectual deficiency. Mm-hmm. Fe- uh, I recall being in medical school at Black Middle College, Meharry, mm-hmm. where they used to call that mild intellectual deficiency social, social cultural mental retardation. Yes, yes. And I, I used to wonder, what is that? You know, I, I wasn't sure it was that black people didn't have books in their home, because I had books in my home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, what is that? Well, if you think about what's right in front of our face, all these liquor stores, mm. and if you think about young black women maybe not knowing they're pregnant till maybe they missed their second period, mm-hmm. and kicking it with their homies, drinking a 40, because why not? Why not? You know, it, and, and they may not even know they're pregnant. And if you go into the Cook County Detention Center, where three-fourths of the children have, guess what, speech and language, learning disorders. All, all the symptoms, all the symptoms of, all, of the future. All four, uh-huh, yep. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Well, so, hey, man, you know, uh, and I've I've read your prescription for getting us out of that as well. So uh, you're you're doing your part in, in diagnosing this 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 uh, problem that we're having, and and, and uh, trying trying to make it through our, our sojourn in this in this uh, white supremacist country that we're in. Yeah. Uh, but no, no, you know, how are people responding to those prescriptions that you provide? Well, you know, I think implementation is difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one problem. The other problem is that models are like toothbrushes. Everybody's got one and wants to use their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've tried to make my model as user-friendly to black people as possible. Um, my model has actually been translated into Japanese, Chinese. It was used during the Chinese 2008 earthquake. It was used during the uh, Japanese tsunami. Is that right? Okay, all right. So a lot of so people I, find I, a lot of people are finding use for it, uh, except the people who uh, sh- who really did really need it most urgently. Well, you know, I think I think black people. You know, I as you know, I used to run a twenty-two million dollar organization. Yes, sir. And it was interesting to me how I'm running this very large business, but I never got any respect as a business person. Mm. Uh, I think most black people are in their business in the military or in church, their business skills. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, of course, business is all about implementation of an idea. But I think it's difficult for black people to implement. Yes. Um, there are some black churches that implement quite well, because my seven field principles are universal in nature. Obviously, if they're translated into Chinese and Japanese, yes, yes. black people use them. Mm-hmm. But I think it's I think it's difficult for us to come together. I'll tell you one quick story. Charles Pinnahues, who was a black psychiatrist, so I use one of my hero black psychiatrists. We were once in Ryan, New York, doing a training on how psychiatrists needed to be able to help black people. Mm-hmm. And there were, say, 100 white, 100 Asian, 100 Latino, and 100 black people in the room. Mm. So during one of his sessions, Peter you said, everybody stand up. He said, now the people who can trace your language of origin, country of origin, and religion of origin of your ancestors sit down. And all hundred Asian people sat down. Wow. <laughs> all hundred Latino people sat down. Mm. Two black people sat down. Ooh, man. That and, was graphic. And, yeah. And 98 white people sat down. Dig so there were two white people standing, two black people sitting, and 98 black people Ooh, standing. Man. So Penny Hughes said, I have a hypothesis, because he's always talking about hypothesis. He said, my hypothesis is that the two white people that are standing are orphans. <laughs> and they were. Uh, wow. He said, the two man, black that people was, that was a down. powerful demonstration. Oh, man. it was beautiful. Ooh, man. So two black people had sat down. You're from Africa. And they he were. said, the, the 98 black people standing here in the same boat as these two white people. And it puts us at a disadvantage. <laughs> That's powerful, man. Oh, I thought it was. I thought you'd like it. Yes, that's powerful, brother. Thank you, man. Appreciate right. it, Doc. Appreciate you Keep being on. Keep up the good work, man. All right, brother. You too. Peace. Yep. Dr. Bell. Now, that was a powerful demonstration and, 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 and a graphic example of our problem. Our, our cultural momentum has been subverted and distorted, and uh, we are seeing the results of it. Macy, yo, hey, my brother, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. How are you, Salim? Not bad at all. All right. Well, hello to you, the WVON uh, family, and to uh, Woods on his birthday yesterday, and Albert, Roxanne, and, and Man Song. Did you hear from Man Song Saturday? Um, I, I forgot, man. I, 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 I don't think he called. Well, maybe he did call. I don't know. Okay. I, I don't but anyway. Know. If he's out there, hello, man. Song, uh, you know, before I ask you uh, a question, I would like to just say if it's okay with you to address uh, those two topics that you talked to Fahim about in terms of the uh, collapse mm-hmm. of the Egyptian Empire, and then also uh, Willie Lynch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. In terms of the Egyptian Empire, you know, it, you, there was a series of invasions of uh, and conquest of uh, Egypt for a while. You first and foremost the uh, the high Sukhs in 1675. Yeah, but I was ta- I'm, I'm talking about post, you know, p- past that period. I'm talking oh. about in, in the modern era, b- you know, uh, in in You're the common about- era. Um, th- that's uh, you know after a- after the the Moorish uh, conquest of Andalusia, mm-hmm. and 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 how the the, the Moors brought Europe out of the Dark Ages. Absolutely. I, I was just about to to uh, mention that too, uh, mm-hmm. but and. I was going to say after the collapse of, not the collapse, but after the decline of ancient Egypt, then erudition was uh, reestablished in the western Sudan with Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And then I was going to say that the same thing you were saying in terms of the Moors bringing light into Europe uh, in so many different forms in terms of uh, structures, uh, bathhouses, uh, uh, the University of St. Corrie, and such and such. But... Um, I in in reference to uh the the uh Willie Lynch letter there w- there were people in that area called Lynch uh, matter of fact uh, uh Lynchburg Virginia was founded by I believe it's a man named Charles Lynch uh and uh, and he incorporated uh where it was incorporated I believe in 1805 but 
uh, in answer to the uh, Willie Lynch letter and stuff like that, uh, though that may not be, as you were saying, uh, uh, an authentic letter, the uh, policy oh, was no in doubt. play. No doubt, yes. Sir. In, in the national po- public policy, in Dr. Claude Anderson's book, Black Labor, White Wealth, he talks about the national public policy. And then uh, you also had, in addition to that, you had uh, meritorious manumission, whereby our, you know, the, the slaveholders, uh, what you call it, overseers, rewarded certain, uh, absolutely, you know, for 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 tricking on or for uh, or for going against and so forth and so on. But then, you know, you had all these elements of uh, that Willie Lynch letter in effect in terms of uh, well, that. That's why. I, that's why I find it. Um, odd that we that we would find so much value in the fact that it was codified in a letter. I mean that mm-hmm. the letter is almost irrelevant because it was not, it was deeply set policy. It was oh absolutely. It was, it, not only that, it was probably second nature of, of the <laughs> folks who were who were in charge. You know, I mean it, it it's not mm-hmm. as if it, it's it was a secret doctrine that was mm-hmm. propounded by the Willie Lynch letter. It was widely practiced uh, in in uh, in white America. And slave owning America. And you know, it even uh, you can even say that it started as early as uh, when the 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 age of so called age of discovery or exploration when they came into Africa and uh, and specifically into uh, the Congo, and you had uh, the Portuguese pitting certain groups against one another Absolutely. there, and then you had uh, what you call the. Uh, uh, manifesto. Uh, this was by uh, created by uh, Manuel the First, King Manuel the First, whereby you proselytize the mind, you enslave the body, and then you take the land. So it was already set into place right then, but it it escalated. It got even deeper here, and then you had that element of fear where you where you had you really had when you when you had. Uh, uh, slaveholders making examples of our ancestors, say, for instance, tying uh, one uh, individual to two uh, horses mm-hmm. and ripping mm-hmm. them apart and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it was a rare, very real thing, but it, it, in terms of what you were saying about the letter itself, uh, even if the letter is not authentic, the policy was there. No doubt. And uh, outside of that, I just wanted to uh, say to ask you uh, if there is any update on the Menard situation. I haven't heard, I haven't heard uh, anything from uh, Brother Vince or, 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 or from, uh, or from um, uh, any of the other uh, spokes folks. <laughs> um, Eddie, Eddie Reed, ha- ha- I haven't heard from them lately. But as far as I know, <laughs> um, it, it, there's, a, there's been a, uh, a steady, a steady stream of folks who have been showing up. Uh, that that's the latest I've heard. I, I, uh, and uh, I, although I haven't heard of any official word from those brothers. And then lastly, uh, you, you remember when uh, First Lady Michelle Obama was here, and there were uh, supposedly a bunch of millionaires yes. putting together money for yes. jobs for our youth. Uh-huh. Uh, I like this. Where is that? Well, I, I understand that this, some of that is beginning to manifest. I heard on, on Matt's show is, there's mm-hmm. a guy who says that there's there's money available for some youth programs this summer mm-hmm. uh, that is a part of that effort to, to flush out some some cash from those folks. Uh, I, 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 in fact, I was I was impressed by the scope of of what he was proposing. I forget the exact specifics of it, but, but I remember I was impressed by it and then said, well, maybe, maybe, you know, the, these guys finally realize that unless, you know, some resources are plowed back into these communities, they're going to have to deal with flash miles on Michigan Avenue for a long time to come. And then, and that, and that's the, uh, that's what you, that's what's needed, you yes. know, uh, it, it, to, uh, to, to infuse that, uh, 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 economic or that uh, that foundation, economic foundation, or or for jobs and stuff like that. That that really, you know, it it, it uh, that, that cultural rehabilitation that Dr. Bell is talking about. The, the mm-hmm. fact that we need to, to shore up uh, uh, and, and reassert our cultural cultural momentum. Oh yeah, well yeah, and but all of that lends to uh, to making that community, our community again, whole. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Talk Maceo. to you on Saturday. All Have right, a great brother. week. All, All right. right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Um, let's see who's next here. Brother Dwight. Hey, Brother Dwight. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing 
a little better than last week. All right. Anyway, uh, glad to hear that. I'm, I'm so happy that uh, uh, you know you did a little deconstruction of the Willie Lynch letter. It yeah. you know it, it it came to my attention somewhere in the early mid nineties, mm-hmm. and it was printed on a it was printed on a sheet of paper by a computer, but it was in this old English font, mm-hmm. and I'm like. You know, <laughs> you know this. This don't. You know, some suspicious about this. Uh-huh. But you know, I still probably bought into it for a while. But you know, it has been proven to be fictitious. Mm-hmm. And what offends me, it was uh, uh, around the same time this letter from the Ku Klux Klan came out. You know, mm-hmm. thank you, black men. Right, right. Others. I remember that. Uh-huh. And I mean, it's you know, it's just so obvious that these letters are are. Uh, similar, and now you say somebody has uh, come out with a, a hip hop letter. Yes, they have. Um, and you know, I'm just offended when fake evidence is used to make uh, real points because our enemies can uh, cite the, the uh, artificiality of the evidence to discredit. That's a very good point, man. You know, the, very the good truth point. parts yes, about what they speak about. So anyway, let me get to this brother, uh, Charles. Ramsey. Ramsey. Uh, you know, I've been hearing, you know, since maybe last night or something, and I haven't, you know, saw a lot of the news coverage and all that. I just see the highlights, you know, glimpses. But uh, somewhere I saw these Puerto Rican guys um, saying that, oh, he wasn't the first one there. Mm-hmm. You know, we had her out before he came. And, I, you know, I didn't know if it was true. I didn't know if these guys were just jealous. Or, From what I understand, it was one guy who said that. Yeah, yeah it was one guy. Mm-hmm. But then I listened to a couple of the 911 calls today. One was from Charles Ramsey, and he said something about the neighbors got her out. Mm-hmm. And the, the Puerto Rican guy uh, was saying, oh, she uh, she was already out, and she went to my house and used the phone. Well, Charles Ramsey's nine one one call was made, I, I guess, on his cell phone. Must have been because uh, he was outside and she was outside. Mm-hmm. But her phone call was made from somebody else's home. You know, the home across the street. Right. And um, the Puerto Rican guy said, "Well, you know, she, you know, she came to my house and used my phone." Well, you know. I'm just hoping that the brother is a legitimate hero Mm -hmm. and not one of these persons who see an opportunity for a limelight. I know he's, uh, I heard he's turned down reward money, said give it to the women and all that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, people do see cameras and run in front of them. Yeah, that's true. They do indeed. And I was wondering that same thing, uh, Dwight, because... Um, he did, in his call, he did say he saw somebody going across the street. And that's what when he decided to go across the street a- after he heard the screaming. He said, you know, and, 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 and when he went over there, he, think, he said that the guy, the guy was panicked and, did, and, and moved away. And so he began to kick the door. But I got the impression that others were kicking it as well. Um, uh, so he did, he did mention that others were involved in, in freeing her, uh, in, in the, uh, in the 911 call. And, and I hadn't heard, and I haven't heard him repeat that, uh, in, in subsequent interviews. Right. And I, you know, I just hope that the, the, uh, young girl, you know, verified, you know, it's right. just so clear when he says, Oh, a pretty little white girl, you know, <laughs> running to the arms of the black man. So I knew something was wrong. Uh-huh. So I hope something like that <laughs> happens, you know, or else we, not he, we will end up with egg on our face. I hear you, my brother. Yes, uh, sir. That, that, that was an interesting uh, uh, story that the uh, doctor dropped. I, man, I wish, wasn't that, that? That was a powerful example, man. It really right, was. right. Uh, yeah. I wish, I wish um, his first name was stated so I could do some research on him as well as the psychiatrist uh Dr. Carl, Dr. Bell, Dr. Carl Bell. 
Okay, that's his first name. Yeah, his na- first name okay, is Carl. Okay, it's the guy, Pender Hughes. Is, is that the, the other guy's uh, name? Pender Hughes, yes. Pender Hughes. That's, that's, that's the psychiatrist he was talking about, Pender Hughes. Just, I think so, it's just a black name. psychiatrist and said Pender Hughes, and you can Google it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, sir. You're quite welcome, my brother. Take care of yourself. All right. All right. Yes, sir. You too. Brother Dwight from Cincinnati. Okay, Sambini. Hey, brother Sambini. I take it to be an honor to follow the young man who's responsible for me winning ten dollars last week. Uh, he just was on. Okay, all right. Well, well, how, how did he? How did he do that again? How and did... James and oh, okay. And Will, because I this this guy that wanted he keeps betting me and keeps losing. I I predicted that. Will and James were called in after I did <laughs> last Saturday. They did, uh, uh, and and that brothers don't take this the wrong way, please. Uh, I've listened to WVN over the years, and and a, a lot of people are very predictable. In that vein, I want to thank Dwight because he took one point out of what I said last week about the Willie Lynch letter as that being proof, not the Willie Lynch letter, Black Wall Street, that somebody was out to get us. Mm-hmm. Okay, I won ten dollars. Thank you, Dwight. <laughs> and again, time will prove whether I'm right or wrong. But that was in 1921. Mm-hmm. My evidence that nobody's out to get us, since these brothers may not come to the meeting, so I can show them. There's a trillion dollar uh, gross national income among African people. Um, mm-hmm. At least about. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they turn it over to these people that they keep saying are trying to get rid of them. Now I happen to know that Europeans did not get where they are being dumb, and why would they kill the goose that's laying all of these golden eggs? Mm. That's the number one reason why I say they're not out to to. Again, I could be wrong, but you asked me a question. Black Wall Street was produced, uh, brought, put out by the House of Consciousness and Kedar Productions in association with Cinemax Real Life. And the, there's a brother, Sar Nieder. Sarnetta, Sarnetta yeah. out of New York. Uh, he's the House of Consciousness. Uh, okay, he, uh, he, he, he's put, he put it out. Mm-hmm. And it begins with the song Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. Yes. Herb Kent said years ago that he used to play a record by Billie Holiday and he stopped playing it because people would hear it and jump out the window to commit suicide. <laughs> It took me two decades later to find out it was Strange Fruit mm-hmm. by Billie Holiday. She sings it, and she's a master in a very eerie manner very eerie. about black men hanging from trees as though they're fruit. Yes, sir. Now, let me give you some highlights, because they interviewed Roscoe Lee Brown, Nell Carter, Ray Don Chong, Robert Fitzgerald, a survivor, Professor John Hope Franklin, Eunice Jackson, a survivor of Black Wall Street, George Monroe, survivor, and Mrs. Skinner, a 93-year-old survivor at the time. Mm -hmm. African-Americans, Catholic, and Jews were all hated by the Klan, according to this DVD. Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was completely burned to the ground in a 12-hour period. I learned from this DVD that by 1915, there was no Klan in America. Then D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation based on the book The Klansman, played to 50 million people in the United States, which was half the population of the United States at that time. Detention centers were set up for all blacks in Tulsa who survived the riots. Now, during the, the, the heyday, the dollar circulated 8 to 10 to 12 times in Black Wall Street. All right, after the, the massacre and everything, ID cards were issued to blacks, and they had to be approved by whites. Martial law was declared. Middle-class whites hid black domestic workers who worked for them. Over 10,000 people were left homeless. 1,200 businesses were burned, and bombs were dropped on Black Wall Street. Two blacks a week were being lynched in Tulsa at the time. 2,200 Negroes at the end of all of this were singing Silent Night. I guess they were so, you know, I guess they had to do something. And, And finally... Women, elderly, and children were marched to the, through the street with their hands raised above their heads. Now, my evidence that that happened then, there are more Africans in Tulsa now than then. Mm-hmm. There are more Africans in the United States now than then. Mm-hmm. I'm calling them Africans. There are more Africans on the planet now than then. So if somebody was trying to get rid of I don't doubt that they may have tried in the past, then they're doing a poor, poor job of it. 
And the criminal element among the blacks are doing a much better job. I said the criminal element. Mm -hmm. And if the criminal element is a small, minute population, like I keep hearing, that's a slap in the face, because that would mean they're outnumbered, grossly outnumbered. What are the rest of the people doing to stop that? Same things with, with, with Europeans. If, if they're, most of them are good, the police officers, law-abiding, and if it's only a small population of people who are uh, creating a problem, what are the rest of the police officers doing, since they grossly outnumber them? What are the rest of the Europeans doing? Uh, Celine, I'm glad my mother taught me how to defeat people in argument without arguing. <laughs> I'm glad she taught me that. And again, um, May 18th, 2013, uh, I'm inviting everybody to come and take part in the discussion. Are African people and their leaders relevant? Mm. May I put the phone about over there? Yeah, go ahead. 773-783-7961. 773-783-7961. That's where you can call an RSVP and let me know that you want to come. I get enough people. I have refreshments. And I'll be this Saturday at the 79th Street Indoor Mall selling my items. Come out and buy some items from Brother Simbini. I have a lot of dollar items. 79th Indoor Mall. And it's at 79th and East End. And I remain always the youngest son, student, and the biggest fan of the greatest person in my life yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. That would be my mother, Barbara Lamar Wilson. And I want to hear Dwight and anybody else. When uh, uh, Just do me a favor. Stop saying they. Name them. Do like Steve Coakley and they has Rod. Name the people that's trying to get rid of African people. And, and stop saying we and they and them and those. Mm. Put the names out there if you want to provide some evidence uh, like I tried to do tonight. All right, brother. All, All right. right. Thank you. Uh, Brother Sambini, let's go to uh, Mr. Wells. Hey, man, how are you, sir? No, oh, I'm blessed. Celine. Another Cincinnati brother. Yeah. All right. Hey, um, <clears throat> how was your day today? Um, it was pretty good, man. It was pretty good. Stop lying to the people. You had a lousy day today, didn't you? No, not really, not really. I mean, you know. Oh, come it, on, it, tell it, the truth. You, you have to say day, com compared you? to what, you know, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, every day is is better than than uh, not having a day. Yeah. Well, I did that for a reason. I just confronted you on your condition, and you know, you should know it better than anybody else. Correct? Yes, sir. Now, what's interesting to me, and I'm really concerned about the community, if we say the black collective, about this filter. And I listen to... The activists, I respect the white. I, I'm more acquainted with the white than anybody else who calls to the station. Why do we allow certain balloons of rhetoric and tomfoolery to come into our filter when they don't belong in the first place? Uh, example. Well, people are talking about this guy, particularly the canal sharpers and running some stuff out that this guy is a Mr. Ramsey, if he's a hero or not. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. Same thing up there in Boston with this sister, Shakur. Um, and black people have to stop. New Jersey. New Jersey. No, well, she's, I'm talking about the New York thing, the connection with them, those two brothers. The one that's living is at the top of the terrorist list out of America. That sister is not. Right. All right. The guy that's still living at the two brothers, he's at the top of the list. He's getting more attention right now. Mm -hmm. All right. He's at the top of the list where last week, uh, Obama's cronies accelerate that to the top to take the black community's discussion potential away from where it should be. Mm. All right? Mm. They had that guy. The same way Cleveland, we found it out now, the Cleveland police had these three brothers some time ago It's coming out. I, I, I'm really concerned. Me. Well, they, they let the, uh, two of the brothers go. There's only one. No, of no, 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 no. People have reported that suspicious activity at the house, and the Cleveland police, which has been under a lot of duress for a lot of foolishness with their service revision the last eight, nine years, like Cincinnati and other parts of Ohio, mm -hmm. is not about that, brother, where the conversation should be. And we're concerned about this guy, Dr. Bell. Why did Dr. Bell spend all that time talking, and there wasn't one thing about institutional accountability of the police department on saving those sisters? That's what a conversation is. They could have been saying the guy was a bus driver. They never went in there and checked on this guy after being in trouble 
I can give a crap about him being a wonderful Cuban bassist. This guy should have been in that house, Re- ransacked, and checked for other reasons. Mm. And, and I'm not hearing that from people. These girls been saved every bit of like maybe like six years ago. If they'd have gone to that house with authority and got them out of there. It's not about is this guy, Mr. Ramsey, presenting himself as a hero. Where is the institutional state where there's tax dollars to protect the public's interest? Well, I think, I think, I think a lot of people are raising those questions about the police. No, the police. no, no. I'm, I'm listening to Black Michelin. I'm hearing it. I, I've heard it, too. I, I've heard people no, raise questions. What? Dr. Bell came on here and spoke for well, 20 Dr. minutes. Dr. Bell, is, Dr. Bell is a psychiatrist, man. He has a certain lane that he travels. He's not gonna, he he no, may not no, want to no, talk no, about no, the no, police no. like you do. No, 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 uh-uh. Because, see, he, you, well, you, you saying you don't have a lane? Just, no, you're no, you're no, saying no, he's not a psychiatrist? Wait, what, what, what's your know about? Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on one second. You said, when he went over that scenario about the people in the room, stand up, sit down, you think that you say the part about the people not having their culture. What's interesting to me is the Asians and the Indians that come here, they still got to come here and be honorary white people. Even though they know their culture three generations back and they practice it, they still come to America and still think that the American education system is A1 across the planet. And not all of them come here to study. That's the point. I, I, don't, understand, I don't understand the point you're listen making, my brother. Listen what I just brother. told you. Listen, listen. Go ahead. He said it was powerful that black people could not connect by cultural transmission and language and what tribe they're from. Those Asians know who they are, where they come from. You know, that was the listened. point he was making. That's but exactly no, 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 the point he was no, making. But wait, 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 listen what you're saying. They're in New York. Still trying to be an honorary white. Well, why you say they're trying to be honorary white? They, they know where they, they don't have to try to be anything. They, they're secure in their own identity. Why do they have to try to be a... Selene, if they were, they wouldn't come to America. If they come were on, secure, come on, man. That's the nature of, that's the nature of travel Selene, on, the, on this planet. That's what Selene, humans Selene, have been listen, doing listen, since we've been here. Listen, Are you trying to listen, say that we don't, we, that's not part of our listen, evolutionary listen, history, my brother? I, I don't know listen, where you're listen, coming from with this, listen, man. Listen, Usually listen, I respect what, what you're no, saying. No, no, listen, listen, listen a second. Listen a second. Listen, listen to me. Mm-hmm. Listen, I've talked to people from Japan. I've talked to people from Africa. Even though they may have this culture, and these people know their language, they still say, look, i got to be an honorary white-thinking person, even though I retain all these cultural benchmarks. I t- I well, that's true. Now, now I, I mean, you, you are, they, they, they do face discrimination in many, in many cases, and you hear that no, from them when you talk to them. They come here to be an honorary white They come here for education, man. They come here. The same reason that we want an integration is we want an access to the fruits of America. No. No, Samir. That's I not it. That's not it. No, I've asked, I said, why do you still come here if you can speak the I think you're just trying to be contrary, more. brother. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see any any uh, substance of what you're saying. I don't even ask some of the ones, man. It was my roommate from Kenya. I'm like, why do you still come here and you know who you are? I still, if I go back home, they accept me as being somebody who's been through this grist meal. I don't like it either. But this honorary white status on a global pl- and I've been sort of we've talked a lot about this. Had a had a jet wait a minute, the Japanese status. May supplant the European status, but the global status is be to to be an honorary white man. Well, that well, that certainly was what what they were in South Africa. They were honorary whites. No, no they still come into America to be an honorary American white man uh, to go back on the global right, scene. Okay, well, Mr. Wells, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. I, I don't quite understand where the brother's coming from, but but uh, hey, sometimes I don't understand. Tommy, hey man. Hey, Celine. First of all, let me say good evening to you, and I, evening. I, I have some breaking news uh, for you uh, right. for uh, what's going on over at Menards. Um, you know, it's basically uh, Menards has said, uh, skip you mm. and go and run and tell that, mm. okay? Because, see, you know, Celine, you know, the path to enlightenment is usually not the actual event. But but the meaning uh, uh, of the of the things that that we just seem to let go right over our heads. The ancestral voices are are, are crying out uh, ever since 2008 from the election uh, of a black man to the, to the White House for the multitude uh, of blacks that felt that if we could just get the White House that that could change our circumstances and situation because the president could go in there and if he was black he could change all of these paradigms in, in, in which we live to the stand your ground. 
Brown uh, a law with mm-hmm. little Trayvon that clearly showed that 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 an individual could be told to stand down and and and, and could commit murder, and then the whole uh, crime scene completely decimated and stuff, and somehow or another uh, uh, money's poured in from all over the place to to support uh, a person who who basically uh, just just broke the law to the to the to the horrific shootings uh, uh, up up there uh, where all these kids get killed and they're still going back and forth about even trying to pass a gun law to the bombings that take place where they view uh, surveillance uh, information and the city and the state and the federal uh, come together. And then, Celine, when you start singing the national anthem is when you have a situation with this Ramsey guy down there, and it clearly goes to show you that even a black person trying to do a good deed somehow will become suspect. Mm. I ask you a question. You don't have to mess or or worry about somebody trying to get you, as they say, somebody's trying to get us, when your mind is already gone. Mm. Because reality clearly shows you where our paradigm is standing, where we are going to, what's happening in, in our lives. And if it wouldn't be for people like yourself... Dr. Bell, who, 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 uh, individuals want to say he was rambling, but if you were listening real, real close at his paradigm of, of going into Cook County and, and, and the law saying that you're, you're innocent and to proven guilty, but in the bowels of Cook County, you're definitely guilty. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, you, until you're proven innocent mm-hmm. and you can be down there in language for years. Yes. I'll just leave you with this, Salim, because really, man, you know, you can be drunk. And tune into your show and listen to some of these people. And it's the best detox you'll ever have in your <laughs> life. Because afterwards, you'll be straight sober. I love you, bro. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> I hear that, bro. Bulls, Bulls, go Bulls. I don't know what's happening with, with the game. I know many of you are probably listening with to, to me as you watch the Bulls. Um, so I, I hope that they are providing the kind of exciting fare that you are seeking. Kay, good evening. How are you, my sister? Hi. I didn't think you were going to get to me. I got you. Well, uh, okay, I'll talk real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned, um, okay, I understand why, based on our previous conversation, why Qatar and Saudi Arabia want to get into the mix. Mm-hmm. But what's in it for Israel? Well, Israel the, Israel has a has had a long term strategy in which they are benefited when their neighboring countries are balkanized and and without any kind of coherence, any kind of coherent uh, position to to, to to confront them with Egypt, Libya, Syria, uh, Turkey. Um, Saudi Arabia, all, all of the countries that have an ideological animus toward Israel, if they are balkanized countries, then they have less of a chance of, of endangering Israel in any way. And so it has been the policy of Israel, according to the Yigong plan, which is a plan that was uh, enunciated um, about 30 years ago, uh, that if, if and, and this is not just those those uh, Arab countries, but the, but Sudan uh Chad all of the na- all of the countries in the region the more balkanized they are the less coherent they are the better it is for Israel mm. so it, the fact that Gaddafi wanted to make a United States of Africa that was a threat to Israel oh absolutely absolutely yes yes ma'am but it's not even in the same I mean it's kind of in the same area but uh, it, it it is in the same area I mean it, Israel is right across the 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 uh the Dead Sea or, or the Red Sea from from Africa. Oh yeah, okay, I, I see it. I was just curious about mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, Israel has a lot to gain from that from that uh from the division in those in those countries. Hmm. Okay, you're just an amazing gentleman. How, how do you get so smart? I mean, what do you do? Like read like Dick Gregory <laughs> says he reads about six papers a uh, day. Well, you know, is that what you do? Uh, it, it's been a, it's been a, I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so you know, it, it, I've built a reservoir. I say. Well, I'll listen to you on Saturday. Thank you, my. So sister. you have a good evening. All right, you too. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, um, Ernest, last last caller. Yes, brother Slim. Yes, sir. Alaykum. Alaykum salam. 
Brother Flame, did you get a book that I sent up there to you? It's what? called The Pain and Suffering of the Black Woman in America. Um, uh, I'm not sure, brother. Oh, Ernest, what, what's your what's, what's name? Muhammad. What's name? Ernest Muhammad. Oh, yes, I think I did get it. Yes, sir. You got I that. Think, yes, sir. Okay. I, th I think so. What it is is I interviewed many black women on my job. I work around the corner for the Pace Company. Yes. And uh, during the five years that I've been working with Pace, it's about 90% black women use that. And I've interviewed them, and they tell me the pain and suffering that they go through on a daily basis just being a black woman in America. And I took their stories and made fictional stories out of it. Oh. And uh, it's really a good book. I'll, I'll, I'll peruse it, man. I'll, I'll check it out. I haven't, you know, man, I get so many books at, at both okay here and other places. Is it readers where to get it at? Pardon me? Yes, sir. Please do. Okay. All they have to do is go to Amazon.com and type in my name, Ernest J. Muhammad, and the, the book will come up. You can get it on for the Kindle or the actual book itself. Very good, brother. I, I, um, I appreciate your, your initiative and your industry. And I'll, I'll, I'll give the book a look and, 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 you know, talk about it a little bit. After you read that first chapter, you may want to give me a call. <laughs> All right, read. my brother. All right, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Uh, last thing, that, that entire first chapter is online to view. All right. Th thank you. I salam alaikum. Well, alaikum salam. Brother Ernest, good book on Amazon, Ernest J. Muhammad. Uh, check it out.